Lord Trenchard, it is a very great pleasure to welcome you again to Bracknell, and we're delighted that you've managed to find a little time to slip away from your responsibilities in government to join us to reminisce a little about your father. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for this opportunity to um, try and um, put over the wonderful father I had, and he was a wonderful father, as well as um, all that he did for the Air Force. I have a great many of his papers. Many of them have arrived in my custody since the one biography that has been written on his life uh, was written by Andrew Boyle. And perhaps, as I know you want um, Group Captain Mason to get a, a feel of the man, um, perhaps I could start with a quote from a letter that Maurice Baring, scholar, writer, temporary staff officer to my father in the Flying Corps, and to David Henderson before him, wrote in a letter to Lady Juliet Duff um, in, uh, on the 20th of September, 1916. He says in that letter, I think I understand what he, that is my father, is driving at better than most people. And I sympathize with the background and the overtones of his mind and his character. He is one of these people who have such a swift intelligence, such a lightning-like grasp, that they don't make themselves clear when they write. I mean they jump to the end of their sentence when they have hardly got the first word out of their mouth. He obviously meant speak, in fact. He is very like Countess Bank in many ways, swiftly inarticulate in the same way, telescoping proper names in the same way. He would give you Ethels the whole time, whatever Ethels were, and he knows exactly what you are thinking. I have never in man or woman met intu intuition to beat his. So long as I can be of the faintest use to him, I shall feel perfectly contented. That's a, a very formidable assessment. <clears throat> there are many quotations which um, in this file of letters have um, come into my custody, and they're very human and very interesting. And someday we must get another biography written. Now, that was a description at the peak of his powers and careers, my father. And now I know you want me to go back to his childhood. The family motto was Know Thyself, in Latin, Noski Tipsum. He was intensely proud of this, and he said that nobody knew themselves. Some were better at it than others. And as we go through this story and see his um, ability to surround himself with people whose attributes were different from his own, we will see that he practiced what he preached. Now, he was born near Taunton and grew up in comparative comfort. His father was a solicitor third generation of solicitor's business. He didn't like his schooling very much, and uh, he was certainly not a scholar. Tragedy overtook the family when he was still 13, and his father was declared bankrupt in conditions which overtook a number of established businesses at that time. This is in the he was born in 1873, so this would have been in the 1880s. He saw all his goods and private belongings sold, his favorite rifle, which he adored, and uh, he saw his family humiliated. Um, his remaining education at a crammer near Reading was paid for by some well-to-do cousins at reduced rates. Mm -hmm. And uh, he managed to pass, after two failures for the Navy and two for the Army, into the militia and got his commission. It is amusing, perhaps, that he failed for the Navy because he spelt the word why, why I. 
But in all these failure examinations, he was close to top in mathematics. And the intuition that Maurice Baring spoke of in that letter which I quoted was, in my view, not intuition, or perhaps I should say that I believe intuition is in fact calculation, a natural calculating ability. And certainly I can confirm Maurice Baring's um, statement that it was slightly embarrassing as a son to live with a father who knew what you thought before you'd opened your mouth, and worse still, he actually knew what you were going to think in a fortnight's time. His mathematics were lightning. He got into trouble for never putting down the workings and simply putting down the answers. Well, anyway, having passed into the militia, he was posted to India. And with this family tragedy behind him and the loss of a sister who he was extremely fond of, who died before the bankruptcy. <coughs> that, was the, that was the little twin sister. Twin right? sister. Uh, not his twin, but uh, right. uh, <coughs> there were twins siblings. who were younger than him. And um, he um, was commissioned in the Royal Scots Fusiliers. And to cut short, because time is short this morning, um, his character immediately showed. He wasn't overcome by these um, tragedies, which undoubtedly burnt deeply into his soul, and his pride of his father and his family remained to the end of his day. But he threw them off, he had by then started reading avidly due to the interest of a cousin called Irvin Cox, the owner of the Field newspaper, who had a marvellous library at Mill Hill and who had started getting him interested in reading. And he threw off um, all um, life's unfairness and indeed as a son later, whenever I said, Dad, that's unfair, it was greeted with cries of mirth and the expression, life is made up of unfairness, more joy and more mirth. This is how he reacted himself. And no sooner commissioned, he organized an infantry regiment that had never played polo into a team that beat the fourth hussars, for whom Winston Churchill was play play playing. He won the All India Rifle Gold Medal became a brilliant polo player, made money because he had none and all the other officers had money. He drank a glass of port on guest nights, but otherwise no alcohol. He couldn't afford it. At times it is reported he went without lunch. Again, he couldn't afford it. But he made money on buying and selling horses and ponies, and he sent money home to his father and mother in a home. And uh, he was on the Afghanistan border um, for one um, set of in incidents. And he was more and more used as an organizer by um, the regiment and by all the life of India of those days. Then he was posted to South Africa. He had a great deal of difficulty in getting there, in fact. And, uh, because of his ability as a horseman, he managed to get himself um, organized in reorganizing the new mounted infantry. And Kitchener himself recognized the horsemanship ability and the ability to get on with every kind of person. And here he, at one stage, um, organized a battalion of Canadian scouts and at another Australian bushmen. And indeed at one stage when he was sent to one of these um, um, regiments as they then were by Kitchener to reorganize it, uh, he sent a telegram saying that two company commanders should be changed. And Kitchener duly agreed and two company commanders were changed. He then sent a telegram saying that the second in command of the battalion should go and another company commander, and he got a telegram back saying, I sent you to reorganize, not disband. <coughs> anyway, he um, was then wounded near mortally um, 
in an ambush, leading his Australian bushman, and uh, was shot straight through one lung, and the bullet on the way out just touched his backbone and dislocated it. Uh, he was virtually given up for dead on several occasions. It took a very long while in very rugged terrain to get him to hospital. The hospital caught fire. He was lowered from the top window on a stretcher. On the way home, there was fever on the boat, and he caught that. And worst of all, he discovered when he got home that he couldn't use his legs due to the backbone damage. And I think probably for the only time in his life after his father's bankruptcy, <coughs> he was genuinely down. And when an old lady called Lady Dudley um, came round the hospitals, and she was a rich lady and was using her own money to send um, convalescent um, soldiers to Switzerland to recover, and she um, sweetly said to him, and now, young man, we're sending you to Switzerland, he gave her rather a dusty answer. But he got an extreme rocket in reply, because she was quite a formidable lady, and was told he was damn well going. And go he did. He couldn't, um, of course, ski, he couldn't skate, he could just get around on crutches. But he saw people tobogganing, so he lay on a toboggan. He was um, 15 stone at that stage, he was six foot three high. And uh, as he used to say to himself, he had to either ride for a win or a fall. And I have lots of lovely snaps of him hurtling through space. Whatever the reason, whether it was the impact on arriving, um, having hurtled through space over the edge, or whether it was the trailing of the toes on the um, uh, ice behind the toboggan, um, his backbone went back into place and uh, he was able to walk again. Um, well, then he, um, not liking ordinary regimental soldiering very much, uh, managed to get to Nigeria. And he opened up, very largely responsible personally for opening up in charge of a company of the West Africa Frontier Force, and later second in command of the battalion. He opened up what is now called Biafra. He subdued a particular cannibal tribe by sending to Harrods for a bunch of uh, fireworks which he let off over their um, camp at night uh, when they were about to eat his doctor who they had captured and killed. And uh, this um, finally um, subdued the Munchi um, and questions were asked in Parliament as to whether Lord Trenchard was not Lord Trenchard, Major Hugh Trenchard was oppressing the uh, innocent inhabitants of um, um, Munchi land or whatever it was called. Um, and then he was posted back um, around 1910 to his regiment doing Northern Ireland um, uh, soldiering and he was finding that down dull. And uh, Eustace Lorraine, a guards officer who had been with him in Nigeria, wrote to him from Upaven and said, come and see um, men like ants crawling. This letter tickled his fancy. He was nearly 40. And off he want, went. Eustace Lorraine actually was killed before he arrived there. You had in those days first to get a, um, a pilot certificate, civilian pilot certificate, and he got his number 270 in a matter of not more than two hours, flying time spread over 13 days just before his 40th birthday. Having at that stage uh, driven, he told me, a car, but never held a car license because cars were rare in those days, and he never, in fact, held a car license. Um, from there, by stages, he was uh, became uh, a second in command in charge of training at the Central Flying School where he had the task of setting the exams for um, RFC and RNAS um, pilots, and in fact, having um, set the exams, passed himself out, he gave himself RFC license number one, and used to say that he'd kept the same high standard ever since. <laughs> well, enough of the background of this irrepressible, <coughs> full of fun father that I had. <coughs> And then uh, the Flying Corps is well documented in official history. 
But I know that you're interested in um, his views on Sir Douglas Haig. He regarded Sir Douglas Haig as one of the greatest men of the century. And um, he um, felt that he kept completely constant, uh, doing what was essential, and there were no alternatives, at a time when politicians at home uh, were intriguing behind his back, uh, were talking about um, removing him from his position. And he felt it was also a time when the French, after Verdun, had been bled nearly to death and were in danger of collapse. He had seen a great deal of French desertion and poor morale. And to him, Haig's fortitude, determination to keep going in the only way that weaponry of that time allowed stood out in his mind as saving Britain and saving the free world at that time. If I could just interrupt there for a second, sir. Standing on the outside, looking at the, the various accounts of both men, they seem to have had a great deal in common in their attitude towards loyalty, for example, determination, uh, the use of resources. Would you comment on that? I think that is true. I think they were very different personalities. For all my father's inarticulateness, which he exaggerated, because he could be incredibly clear, it was impatience more than inarticulateness, um, but he was a flamboyant personality, um, uh, obviously an extrovert. Uh, Haig was a quieter man, I think, but um, in substance, in character, and in integrity, I think they had a lot in common. And, of course, the criticisms after the war by Little Hart, uh, by Winston Churchill, by Asquith and by others of the um, um, Hague campaigns and of the infantry assaults on a front where there were no angles to turn, um, hurt him very much. And I'm sure that he would feel, as I certainly do, that bomber command in the Second World War had... Um, the role, in a sense, that the infantry had to fulfill in the first. It had uh, one of the biggest and bloodiest roles. And such are the sensation seekers in selling books and newspapers uh, that um, uh, the bloodiest roles, where there are inevitably the biggest roles, where there are inevitably the largest number of mistakes, because mistakes are made in war particularly, these are bound to be criticised, bound to be debunked. Of course, your father tended to feel, sir, didn't he, at several times in his career, that there were occasions when to accept bloodshed in perhaps rather more than proportional amounts at one time could, in the longer term, save a lot of suffering and shorten war. <coughs> I was thinking comments on this, as we'll, we'll come on to in his observations on World War II, but I was thinking of his emphasis on the offensive and yes. longer range bombing yes. in, in World War II. Well, I think um, this was not um, just a philosophy of um, um, bearing extra casualties in order to win territory or anything like this. It was a philosophy as to the best way to fight the war, the way to finish the war quickest, mm -hmm. and the way thus to save uh, the majority or the largest possible number of casualties. And certainly, um, in terms of the offensive, um, uh, he and uh, all those engaged in the Flying Corps in those days were very quick to um, see that in the three-dimensional air, in the weather conditions as they were, with aeroplanes as they were then, but perhaps still are today, any absolute defence, as on the ground, or relative defence, as on the surface of the sea, in what they called three-dimensional air, was just not a possibility. And the papers speak of uh, whatever strength and number of aeroplanes, and they never got the numbers they asked for, but whatever strength he had, it would be impossible for him to defend the Western Front. Uh, in accordance with the demands of um, much of the field commanders of the army mm -hmm. to keep the German aeroplanes back behind the line. And uh, they expressed the need for the offensive um, in uh, many different ways at that stage, and they uh, gave illustrations showing the effect of um, uh, attacking Lille, for instance, in Belgium, 
and the fact that this led to the movement of German fighting squadrons and anti-aircraft units away from the battle area um, and thus diverted and um, uh, split uh, the defenses of the enemy. And so they formed very early on and both he in his um, somewhat mundane prose and Maurice Baring for him in excellent prose made very clear that um, the aeroplane was clearly an offensive weapon. Yes. Um, it's worth recording, because it has been said before now, that at that stage um, he, and indeed Haig and the army, did not understand the possibilities of air for bombing independent of um, um, the army. This, of course, is not true. Uh, they had one long-range bombing squadron by the 6th of June, 1916. They'd asked for many more. Um, there is a quotation in a paper of the 6th of June, 16, saying that um, uh, this is that the RFC is not at present in a position to indulge in long-range um, bombing and the ten squadrons in two wings had previously been requested and were necessary in order to do it. Haig endorsed this. Haig was actually asking whether the RNAS planes, which um, were not so involved in the mortal struggle on the Western Front, and some of the larger ones couldn't be used to bomb behind the lines. So the picture that the media have presented to you of uh, the army and of Haig not <coughs> understanding um, the powers of the air is palpably untrue and is shown in letters and papers yes. which I <coughs> still possess. Yes, I think there's, there's a very, very important minute, which I know you have, sir, which um, Lord Trenchard sent to General Haig in 1916, which sets out, I think, very, very comprehensively the importance of the point you're making of using one's own offensive air not necessarily on the enemy's heartland, but deep behind his own lines to draw off the fighters, to draw off all the effort and, and protection in a sort of defensive offensive. Yes, I think it's That is per perfectly true. The maximum conceivable amount of petrol at that sort of stage that an aeroplane could carry was eight hours flying time. Yeah. They were trying to extend it, but that was what they were, um, and the pace of the aeroplanes in those days was not what it is now. Uh, on the 12th of October, 1917, um, he wrote um, a um, memorandum, which I'm going to quote from again, if I may, because once more he has been um, criticised and the RFC staff have been criticised for opposing the formation of the Royal Air Force um, during the war. And it is true that he technically did this uh, because at that stage he believed it would split rather than unify the already two air forces that existed, the RFC and the RNAS, and would need, lead indeed to a third. On the 12th of October 1917, I can quote him as follows, with the two services working independently there is bound to be friction and serious danger of loss of efficiency owing to competition for machines and personnel. He went on to recommend one member of the War Cabinet to coordinate the two services and to decide at War Cabinet level where the resources should be uh, placed. I quote again from the same memorandum, such an organization will enable us to create a single air service automatically on the conclusion of the war. Now, General Smuts had been asked by the Prime Minister on the 11th of July, and I have the Cabinet um, um, meeting minute, which is headed German Air Raids on London, General Smuts was asked by the Prime Minister and the Cabinet to look into what could be done against German air raids on London and should there be an independent air force in order to be able to respond by bombing Germany. Therefore, what my father generously, and he was always generous in my view in what he said of others, said about Smuts, and he used to say Smuts had far more foresight than I did, 
uh, if we hadn't created an independent air force in the war, it perhaps would never have been created. But it wasn't foresight, it was response to the bombing of London. And what it did, and the argument that went on, was whether there should be an independent bombing force, independent of the RFC um, in the field under General Haig's command, independent of the RNAS. Yes, one air force, for all the supply point of view, but from an operational point of view, three air forces, not two, and he'd already for many years been railing against yes. two. Yes. Um, in 1917, in November the 17th, it is worth recording Haig as saying, I recommend long-distance day bombers, 25 squadrons, long-distance night bombers, 20 squadrons, a total of 2,400 long-distance bombers. Um, now, anyway, this political argument continued to meet a political need and it was decided that the Air Force should be established and my father was asked to be the first chief of the Air Staff which he became under Lord Rotherbear. This was not a happy interlude of only months and uh, their relations um, were not good uh, there were constant arguments. There was the withdrawal of aeroplanes from France uh, to defend London without the CAS being fully consulted. And um, after many, many internal memoranda, patient memoranda, my father felt that in March 1918 that he was uh, not fulfilling a function. He'd been torn as to whether to accept it because he feared diversion and division of the main effort on the life and death struggle which at that stage was being fought in France and he resigned. For reasons which I won't go into his resignation was held up for a month and then released as it proved in the last major offensive that the Germans launched on the Western Front. So it didn't look awfully good. And um, France and indeed before the armistice he was appointed commander of the inter-allied um, uh, bombing force. Uh, he found this to be the diversion that he felt it would be. His private diary which he kept at that period is um, very interesting and uh, demonstrates the extra staff cost and expense within his view actually less bombing squadrons being supplied and used in a less coordinated way uh, than would have been the case if um, his own and General Haig's requirements um, when he was in charge of the Flying Corps had been met. It's, if I again say, if I may interrupt at that point, um, <clears throat> I didn't, as you know, I hadn't had any access to the diary and I wasn't aware of that. But among the papers here at Bracknell, which you've expressed an interest in, there is a letter from Sykes to your father in July 1918, asking him to give Sykes a forecast of the likely bombing achievement and delivery for the next six months of the independent force. A Sykes to use at Brussels as part of the arguments for the creation of the new inter-allied force. Mm. And your father's letter is accompanied by a table, and the typed duplicate is downstairs. And there's a footnote to the table which says, these figures are purely theoretical and in no way can be expected to be borne out by fact. And in, in fact, <coughs> at the end of five months, the achievement was 3% of what the theoretical figures had, had promised. And, and again, your father was fully aware of that. There are many entries as to the comparatively small amount achieved. Um, the 26th of June is an entry about the aerodromes uh, having been prepared and still being largely empty, the squadrons and aeroplanes not having been delivered. Um, which he real, realistically knew would be the question. Um, so that the argument really was about timing for the creation of an independent air force as such, which he foresaw in peacetime, and he didn't want it in um, the middle of the battle because it would effectively create a third operational force. 
Uh, clearly, this was a view well shared by Sir John Salmon, who took over the Flying Corps, yes. who found that uh, there are references on the 27th of June to Salmon feeling the pinch of the um, existence of the independent air force. Uh, uh, Bomber force. Well, bomber force. Yes. Yes. And so um, the war and the end of the war came, and um, uh, he was um, then obviously out of a job because the newly formed um, um, bomber command would certainly not be required. And it was Winston Churchill who called him back. Um, and um, it's um, interesting that. Um, he caught at that stage the very severe flu that was going around at the end of the war, which killed an awful lot of people. And he really did very nearly die with it. And um, Maurice Baring and my mother, to whom he was then, I think, becoming secretly engaged, who was a widow, um, um, managed, I think, to bring him round more than the doctors of the day. Was the, this the illness when you, forgive me, when, <coughs> when your mother arrived in the dress of the nurse? and? Uh, uh, that is correct, and found Morris Baring sitting outside his door and thought he was the doctor. Yes. Um, anyway, he wrote um, three times to Winston Churchill saying, I'm clearly not fit enough, you must get another. And uh, I'll just quote Winston's um, reply to the third letter, uh, which, as you see, I have as written in Winston's own hand. I'm looking forward so much to you coming back at the end of April. You've been off since um, the end of February, I think. Mind you get thoroughly fit first. There is no question whatever of anyone taking your place, and I have no intention of acting upon your various offers to resign, which arise from your high sense of duty. I'm sure you have most valuable work to do for the flying service and we will hold the fort until you are restored. With all good wishes, believe me, yours ever, Winston Churchill. Which mm -hmm. rather a nice letter. <clears throat> anyway, he came back and was CAS for a further 10 years, just over 10 years. Um, and perhaps at this stage, I know you're interested in um, what he regarded as the important things in becoming CAS after a bloody war and uh, in what was necessary for the Air Force. What, what I was reflecting on, just as you were saying that, sir, was um, how many times um, had very small incidents gone in a slightly different way, we wouldn't have had your father as CAS? Uh, undoubtedly so. Um, the most obvious case being, being the bullet outside the farm in the Boer War. Mm. Then you had the illness, mm -hmm. then you had his original resignation. So many different things. He would be the first to say that there was a lot of luck. He used to record when he was made a brevet major in West Africa that he suddenly found himself looking down at his shoulder and seeing a crown on it and saying, how on earth did that happen? <laughs> um, but having said that, of course, some of the reasons that he overcame all that ill luck was the completely irrepressible personality mm. and the driving force which, um, to quote one of his philosophies, to make something a little bit better each month. As, as a younger officer, he'd also though, projected an image of being rather a hard man, hadn't he? Um, well, I you think, get this friendly. flavor out of um, Andrew Boyle's Gosh, book. Yes. But again, after that book was published, and I, of course, um, only knowing him, because he was over 50 when I was born, as a more elderly man, um, could not argue with an author um, who um, was looking at papers and interviewing people from his early years. But I met um, one of his company commanders who wrote a book about the West, Afri uh, the West African Frontier Force um, after Boyle's book was written. And I said to the company commander, I suppose you had a hell of a time. He was a bit of a martinet. He said, what do you mean? He said, we had enormous fun. He said, mind you, you had to be efficient. Yes. Yeah. And you had to be on time. And this is the one bit of discipline yeah. that from a son's point of view, uh, you would get into considerable trouble yeah. if you were not on time. 
But um, so that I am convinced that the father I knew with a mischievous sense of humor um, and a constant bubble, the smile which you've seen in many photographs, was the same when he was younger. And I believe that Andrew Barr perhaps um, painted the picture, which is often um, recorded, but often by those who didn't know the old man terribly well. Well, the old man was furious about that, or the like. This is life. I expect people are saying it about you, Group Captain Mason, <laughs> and about me today. But no, I think um, the character, the bubble, the sense of humor was always there. And as he became CAS, the emphasis on people mm. and on quality mm. is the supreme emphasis, which I'm sure you would agree. Yes, he had several views, didn't he, on people. I remember you mentioned the other day when we were speaking, sir, about um, how, what was, the, what was the specific aphorism that if you surrounded people with... Nice people make nice things, That's she right. used to say. And uh, um, these were part of many simple philosophies that he held, like life is made up of unfairness, which he never qualified, and which you gradually learnt what they meant. Jobs make people, not people jobs, was another. And this um, represented his desire always to push on young people. And uh, he wanted this need saying, perhaps equal with people and quality, he wanted to keep the Air Force a young service. He'd been 21 years a captain in the army himself. And uh, he believed that um, you developed people's potentials by throwing them in at the deep end, provided they had the character and the intelligence they would rise to it. He had no use for the kind of officer who said, uh, in another three years, this man may be fit for X, Y, or Z. None at all. He wanted to know why not now, if he thought the young man concerned had the character and the basic intelligence that he was looking for. He recognized, I think, very early, in fact, he knew it from the RFC days, and so did all his colleagues, no doubt, that the Air Force had to be completely different from other forces in two main respects. It was a technical service. It depended on the engine in the air, and it would depend upon the scientific life of the nation. And it would require a large number of officers. And this presented straight away a problem of um, acceptable careers mm. to the able. He believed that uh, unless you had the best in an organization, you didn't get the second best and the next best and all the rest. And therefore, um, for the good of the whole, you had to concentrate on the career pattern that you could give to the best and to the good, and to make that an adequate career pattern in a service that was bound to have a great many officers. It is on this and on his own pencil jottings uh, that the whole of the short service system and all of that philosophy was based. Uh, the auxiliary squadrons, of course, and the reserve squadrons were a necessary ability to be able to utilize the um, high caliber uh, adventurer, even now do well, he said, from civilian life to be able to expand the force. But the emphasis had to be on, uh, in fact, getting the foundations of the force in terms of the nucleus really solid, solid in terms of quality, solid in terms of people, and with a career pattern that allowed a relatively good promotion this required links with civilian life, as did the technical need of the service, to a very high degree. And uh, tremendous efforts were put in. Trade union recognition for Halton, I can remember trade union leaders at home, recognition that um, um, qualifications should count in civilian life, masses of individual dealings with firms to um, uh, ensure that the short service um, uh, commission 
people would get out early enough and be able to have a successful alternative career. The papers are full of this effort, this quotation, this kind of quotation. Yes, I, again, sir, if I could just interrupt. <coughs> uh, I think it's interesting when you look back at the, the history and the origin of the Staff College, that originally the Air Staff Plan was for Staff College to go to Halton. But Lord Trenchard himself changed the priority and suggested it was rather more important to get Halton and the apprentices bedded down than it was for Staff College. And so Staff College went down to an ex-WRAF quarters down at Andover and Halton moved into the palatial home that there is now. Yes. Well, Cranwell, Halton, and um, this establishment, obviously, were the three pillars of yeah. this um, people organization and uh, the superlative nature of it. It's worth quickly recording, because, again, he's been recorded in the press as being a bomber-only man, that the 50 Squadron organization, when he left his 10 years in um, the Air Force, was recommended to include 17 um, fighter squadrons. Um, and this was before the days of the invention of radar, or, let one add, the counter-invention of window, which we yes. took rather a long time to use. Um, whether these things, you can judge, I can't, I've never been in the Air Force, um, you, Captain Mason, whether these things have fundamentally changed the three-dimensional air and the advantage of the offensive, I would doubt, but certainly up to the day he left, the balance was balanced and was reasonably, I think, correct. correct. The fact that he was placing the emphasis on the permanent organization and on people is well shown um, from a quotation, if I can find it, um, which, um, I can't find it quickly, um, which, um, uh, while enabling us now um, to have the first essential service squadrons adequately trained and equipped, will be capable, this was the culmination of a paper in 1919, will be capable of producing whatever time may show to be necessary in the future. That, I think, um, perhaps sums up all kinds of people at every level, every age mixed at every level, was a philosophy. In peacetime, he wanted nothing to obstruct conflict of opinion conflict of different opinions was progress, in his view. Um, thus, he did not want a chief of defense staff uh, in those days. He proposed instead, in a letter to Hanke, which was adopted, that uh, the, there should be a chiefs of staffs of the three um, uh, services committee, and that the chair should rotate but that they should be individually and collectively responsible for the military defense of the United Kingdom. And he wanted the arguments to continue, not in public if possible, but in private, because in his view, progress came through competition, through conflict of opinion. His recommendation was that come war, you would need a General Supremo. This is similar to a philosophy in relation to the technical requirements of the service. He wanted all officers to fly in those years, but to study one or more technical subjects as well. But at the outbreak of war, should it come, a supply branch would be inevitable and must be set up. Those, I think, are two important and general philosophies which probably bear the test of time and quite different technical requirements which exist today. Um, of course, the battles for survival of the Air Force are well recorded. The um, um, peacetime use of the Air Force in the Middle East um, to which he owed quite a lot to T. E. Lawrence um, in um, conception. Um, the lovely story of Gertrude Bell at the Cairo conference asking him whether he would drop bombs on dissident Saudi Arabian tribes. Um, and uh, he saying no, he would land and give them a, a, a bottle of Eno's fruit salts. And T. E. Lawrence at the conference said, I agree with Sir Hugh. <laughs> 
And that started the friendship, which led to his efforts to rehabilitate Lawrence, for whom he had great admiration, great sympathy, and understood the mixed-up nature of his character only too well, recognized the genius. In a sense, he failed, but perhaps um, not entirely, in that Lawrence did very useful work, as you know, in the... I think one of the things that, that strikes somebody of a different generation, sir, from your father, is how thoroughly a man could combine an enormous breadth of vision and foresight with this individual interest in people, individual interest in, in contemporaries. You find some people who can keep their heads a long way ahead and forget what's happening around them, but your father never did that, did he? He was... Inherent a... humility in a much better appreciation of himself than any other man that I've ever met. Oh and therefore of, um, between those two, of the realization that what one man can achieve, yes, yes. and he never regarded himself as unique indeed, if you wanted to make him angry, you said you were unique, it's all right for you, Dad, you were unique. It used to produce um, a real um, onslaught. Um, he had deep humility and a full realization. Um, my words, however intelligent you are, you can only do three times as much as the next man and that something of the order of an air force and of uh, the planning of the defense of this um, country for the years ahead, that that should be based on one man's ideas would have horrified you. Yes. Yes. And this is why you get the combination of the, yes, the inspiration to look forward came from him, yes. but uh, the um, motivation of masses of other people to look forward um, uh, this was due to his knowledge and understanding of himself primarily, on which an understanding of other people must be ba based. As you know, he had a phrase that the last thing he wanted to see in the Air Force was what he called brains through the usual channels. <laughs> he continued to meet um, with um, relatively young officers and others throughout his years of CAS, in demi-official dinner parties, yes. without their commanding officers there. Yes. At times, uh, there were those who um, uh, thought that this was a wrong procedure. Uh, but I think nobody really felt this for long, because the sheer integrity, openness, and honesty of uh, mm. my father made sure that it was not abused. Yes. Yes. But it made sure that he kept himself young. Yes and got a feel of what um, one can see so clearly when one is junior in any organization. You may not know what to do about it, but you, you can, can see, see a lot yes. more clearly looking upwards, yes. whereas when you start to look downwards, there are lots of smoke screens yes. to avoid you seeing what yes. is really going on. Well, sir, I'm afraid time is drawing to a close. Um, I would just like to put one final question to you, if I may. <coughs> um, as, as, as we both know, your father's influence didn't end by any manner of means when he left the service. And right until the end of the war, he was writing, he was prodding, I think was the expression you used, wasn't it? He, he was prodding other people's opinions. And when you look downstairs at those typescripts, <coughs> with their enormous fluency and cogency, one thinks of the first point you have made about the young man who, who had difficulty, for the reasons you've given, in articulating. Um, when he came to write, do you, do you have any memory, personal memory, of him writing those letters, doing the prodding? Extremely clear and not at all, well, um, mainly grammatical letters I got at school. Um, and um, this excuse that he used to make in order to get others to work for him, that he couldn't do it, is demonstrably not so on things that he has written obviously mm. himself and wrote in retirement mm. himself. Mm. No, his schooling was not of a high academic order, but uh, his ability to get the grammar right and get it clear uh, was perfectly possible. In speaking, he was usually in such a hurry and also um, so conscious that the other person will probably have understood what he's about to say when he said half a sentence, that he would jump on to the latter half of the next sentence. And uh, 
this produced the reputation of being inarticulate. It was the hurry, it was the fact that he couldn't get the words yeah. quick enough. Well, certainly there's sufficient evidence downstairs to indicate just how wrong that is. Sir, I'm afraid um, we must now draw to a close, and as you are well aware, the Staff College is only one part of your father's legacy to the Royal Air Force. Um, we hold his memory in great affection and in very great respect, and we are extremely grateful to you this morning for coming to us and to for outlining and illustrating so much of his character and personality. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Thank you. Thank you.